spied among us, even as it is all over the world. We decree that the word of the Lord has preeminence over the thoughts and hearts and thoughts of men. Katondo, Legrada Zocolo, the Brina, Kakaka Lida Baba, Egebo Zocolo, the Brina, Katonda, the Baba, Egebo Zakele, the Brina, Katongla, the Boroko, the Sekele, the Baba Haya, Egebo Zakia, the Baha. Thank you, blessed Lord. In the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we rejoice that we come humbly before your precious, holy written word, and we come to be fed by your word tonight. And we thank you for the mighty Holy Spirit that lives in our hearts to guide us into all the truth. So we decree that all over the world today, as your word comes with clarity, revelation, knowledge floods the nations like never before. Veils are destroyed. Burdens are terminated. Your people are built up, equipped, edified, and Jesus is glorified. Thank you for your word that will fulfill your counsel in the hearts and minds of your people. And nobody leaves this service the same way they came. We give you praise, glory, and honor honor for answered prayer in Jesus precious name and every believer says a powerful amen. amen we want to welcome everybody connected to this service by way of kingdom life network facebook youtube twitter instagram we also want to welcome the Aquaibom state community all of you in Aquaibom that are connected by way of comfort fm xl fm radio Aquaibom you you fm heritage fm inspiration fm we're so glad to have all of you connected to the service do me a favor call a friend a loved one a family member ask them to tune to this radio station right now life is flowing through the airwaves what a joy to have all of you social media community our friends and family on social media I want to thank all of you that have continually make it a point of duty to ensure that you get these broadcasts on your pages and push them as far as you can. I want you to know that that is part of you know, your labor for the kingdom of God that will not go unrewarded. So tonight, again, do me the same favor. Help me share the video with as many people on your, on your Facebook page. Share with all the groups on your page. Join more pages. Let's flood the earth with the fragrance of Jesus' grace. Also, create watch parties. Drop them on WhatsApp group, monogram, telegram. Let's get the word to the ends of the earth. All our Bible study centers and house centers, we're so glad to have all of you connected. Guys, get ready. We're going to have an adventure together in the word of his grace. Campuses around the world, we're glad to see everybody. Those joining for the first time today, well, welcome to an adventure and a feast in the word of his grace. And everybody in the building, are we excited to be here tonight? Praise God. Can we give the Lord a greatest shout? Glory! Amen. Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible, and you can be seated with your sweet, smart self tonight. Mm, 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 mm. All right, let me announce the good news. The good news is that my two books are out. And, uh, you know, I want to announce that this one on the communion table is ready right now. I have it in my hands, I tell you. Um, let me just read quickly uh, the book on the communion table. It says the subject of the communion table is one that requires diligent and careful study a vital way of reading the scriptures is to ensure that no portion of it is read in isolation that is it ought to be read together as a single material it is therefore pertinent to assert that the new testament the new testament text have the old testament books as its background this implies that all the books of the old testament text are taken at the basis on which the New Testament is written. In this book, Dr. Abel Damina approaches the teaching of the communion table following this pattern. He examines exegetically subjects such as the promise of God, the Old Testament feast, the difference between the Passover, breaking of bread, and the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table, and walking in love. Welcome aboard this adventure. Get ready to have your mind challenged with the scriptures in the light of Christ. Be prepared to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Enjoy. Very loaded. This is one book that answers so many questions. Everybody, what does the Bible mean by 
As often as you do this, you do in remembrance of me. What does the Bible mean? Well, here is it. You get a copy of it. Call our office. Send a mail to us. And our office will get this book to anywhere you are around the world. We've put up an advert of it also on my page. You can share the advert and get more people to get aware of what is going on. The second book that is on the way coming that will be here any moment from now is Curses, Myth, and the Truth. Curses, Myth. And the truth. I also want to recommend for you my book on Bible truth about material wealth. If you have never read this book, this is a book you don't want to go the next few days without reading. reading. Then there's this other one on the last days. A doctrinal insight into the last days and its events. People keep asking, this coronavirus vaccine is 666 in it. Well, this book will help you. But another good news is that on Friday, Saturday, we're going to be examining a number of things on this Antichrist. We're going to get into some doctrinal, you know, some doctrinal journey on Friday and Saturday on Antichrist and all this whole thing about chips, about vaccines and about all of that. So you want to get more people to hook up to the broadcast, especially people that are really panicking, people that have been terrified and frightened and have, you know, been told all kinds of theories, all kinds of theories around the world. Encourage more people to be part of what we're going to be teaching on Saturday. And it's good they begin to follow even from tonight or tomorrow so that they have a background to the things we're going to be saying as we get into that segment of our teaching of the new creation camp meeting in Christ's realities. Let's get into the word, all right? <clears throat> we have been looking at the subject of identification. Brother Paul's revelation of identification, what does it mean? What did Paul teach concerning identification? John chapter 5 verse 39. John chapter 5 verse 39. Search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. So we say the scriptures are Christ's. It is his Bible. The Bible is Christ's Bible. That is the Bible centers around him. In Luke chapter 24 verse 25 to 27. When Jesus met those disciples of his on the way to Emmaus. He said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now the church needs to educate people in the world. The church needs to educate, not just inform. The church needs to educate people in the world. People must be brought to a place where they think differently and in alignment with the word of God. Where people are able to think in accordance with God's word. Then their lifestyle will begin to emerge from the teaching of God's word. Their lifestyle will emerge from the teaching of God's word. So, the teaching of God's word is key, is fundamental. You know, a typical service is a teaching service. A typical service is a teaching service. The reason for gathering around in church is for the teaching of God's word. In Luke chapter 24 where we read, Jesus took 40 days to teach the disciples concerning the things that he had communicated to them previously. Look at the teaching of Jesus again. Jesus focuses his teaching on the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow. Keep that somewhere. Come with me. To John chapter 16 verse 12. John chapter 16 verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Next verse. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. 
You know, this is Jesus' disclaimer on the things he had taught. He will show you things to come. Look at Luke chapter 24, verse 26. Luke chapter 24, verse number 26. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? That is, the Spirit will show you things to come. What are those things to come? The glory that will follow. The glory that will follow. All right, now, a little recap. We have said that Christ is a man. If Christ is a man, is he fully a man? Yeah. Is he a man, spirit, soul, and body? Yeah. So he is a man, spirit, soul, and body. Now, from these teachings, and for this teaching, we restrict ourselves to spirit and body. We said body, the sin. Spirit and soul, the unseen. So we call spirit, spirit which combines the soul. Now, the spirit and body, because the soul is in the spirit anyway. Look at Luke chapter 4 verse 18. <clears throat> Luke chapter 4 verse number 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. If he was, if he was in his incarnation anointed, in Luke chapter 4 verse 18, he now says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And is quoting from Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 61 verse 1 to 3. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. That means the spirit came upon him and he is anointed. For him to be anointed... We will look at what it means to be anointed. We will examine what it means to be anointed. We have seen the sufferings of Christ, which refers to his death and his burial. And we're also examining the glory that will follow, which is his resurrection and ascension. Stay with me. So the glory that will follow the death and burial is resurrection and ascension or exaltation. Come back again to Luke chapter 4 verse 18. Let's read together. Luke 4 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. We need to know the meaning of the word anointed. Because that word is used carelessly today. Anointed man of God. Anointed songs. Anointed footballer. Anointed goalkeeper. Anointed driver. Anointed handkerchief. Anointed water. Everything is anointed. So let's look at the meaning of the word anointed. Christ, like we said, is a man, spirit, soul, and body. Isaiah 61 verse 1 says, The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me. That word is used 69 times in the Hebrew. 69 times in the Hebrew. It is the Hebrew word meshach. Meshach, it means to paint a surface or to smear. To paint a surface or to smear. And it simply means something was added. Something was added. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath anointed. Something was added that was not there before. For example, when you say this lady 
painted her face. What you are saying is, this lady has added something to her face that was not there before. So, that means something was added to Jesus. The use of the word because. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because. The use of that word because he has anointed me. It's indicative of something added. If he was God in that incarnation, then he wouldn't need anything to be added to him. Because God does not need anything to be added to him. But something was added to Jesus because he said the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath anointed me. Something added. In Acts 10 38, brother Peter said how God anointed Jesus. He didn't say Jesus came anointed. He said, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. How God anointed means it wasn't done in deathless past. It was done in time. It was done in time because that word is the word creo in the Greek. The same transliteration where you have the Septuagint Greek. The Septuagint Greek is where the Greek transl transliterates the Hebrew. So the translation of the word to anoint is the word creo. Same word, it means to put oil on the surface. To add, to beautify. Just like the Jews will use the word anoint for rubbing stuff like cream. Anoint your face. Anoint your hands. You rub cream. It is called anointing. When you rub cream on your face, you are anointing your face. Now, in the New Testament, it is used in Acts 10, 38, where we read, and in Acts 4, 27, give us Acts chapter 4, verse number 27, Acts 4, 27. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod, whom thou hast anointed, thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. Jesus was referred to as anointed. That means there was an act that made him anointed. He didn't say who is the anointed. He says he was anointed. So notice, every time he uses the term anointed, it refers to a particular act. It refers to a particular act. That is, Jesus was anointed. He was not born anointed. There was always a participle that shows that it happened. Acts 4.27 where we read, Acts chapter 4 verse 27. Put it up for me. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus... Whom thou hast anointed. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse number 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 21. Now, he which establisheth us with you in Christ. And hath anointed us is God. Anointed. Consecration. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. That is the humanity of Jesus. God anointed him. Look at verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 verse number 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. 
So verse 8 is the deity of Christ. Verse 9 is the humanity of Christ. The prophecies came out like that, mixed. It's when you study that you are able to separate them. That is when you will know where he's talking about his deity and where he is talking about his humanity. Why was that word anointed or what was it used for? It was used for consecration or anoint or anointed. That means Jesus was anointed. You never say to your dad, Dad, the day I become your son, I will buy you a car. Then it's not your dad. If, you're, if it's your dad, you don't become. You are. Huh. You are a son. You don't become a son. If you have to become a son, then you are not. He's not your dad. But you can say the day I become your manager, I will buy you a car. Because as a son, you are not automatically a manager. But your father can appoint you a manager over his business. But as a son, you don't need your father's appointment. That is who you are. That is your nature. Now, that means there was a day you became a manager. So, when he says how God anointed, it means there was a time when Jesus was anointed. He was not born anointed. When was he anointed? Remember Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because. So the question is, when was he anointed? When was Jesus anointed? Matthew chapter 3 verse 16. Please stay with me. Matthew chapter 3 verse number 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lightening upon him. 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Please stay with me. The spirit came on Jesus according to John's testimony. Mark chapter 1 verse 10. Pay attention. Mark chapter 1 verse 10. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Pay attention to the tenses and verbs. Same word used for chosen. Luke chapter 3 verse 21. Please pay attention to the tenses. Luke 3 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying. The heaven was opened. Next verse, 22. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. Observe the word descending. Descending is the Greek word katabaino. Katabaino is spelled as K-A-T-I-B-A-I-N-O. Katabaino is used 82 times. Katibaino is used for a literal descending. A literal descending. That is, is an eyewitness world. That means somebody saw it happen. It's not God that said the spirit is upon him. It was John that said the spirit was coming or descending upon him. Katibaino is an eyewitness account. That means it is used by someone who saw it happen. It's a literal use of words. It was a literal descent. In Luke chapter 9 verse 54. Luke chapter 9 verse 54. Look at it again. Apply. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, 
Will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? The fire was not there. So the fire of Elijah actually came. The word katibainu. That means the spirit of God actually came on Jesus. Katibainu is used for literal descent. It must be seen, it must be observed. Then look, uses another word, bodily. The word bodily is the word somaticos in the Greek. Somaticos is spelled as S O M A T I K O S. Somaticos. It means in person. In person. It's not like the spirit sent a symbol. It says the spirit came in person. In other words, just like every prophet of the Old Testament, John is bearing witness to Jesus. He is Jesus' witness. Jesus' witness that he is the Christ is the prophets. Now John is an eyewitness prophet. He was present when Jesus was anointed. I mean physical presence. The word form, the word shape, that is bodily in a shape, is the word heido in the Greek. H-E-I-D-O. Heido is used for visions. So notice, John saw it happen. Which means, until this point, was Jesus anointed? No, he wasn't anointed. Because this is the first time it is happening. So, that angel did not give record to this. The angel that announced the birth of Jesus didn't give us this record. It's the prophet who did. So, until this point, he was not anointed. So, there was a literal descent of the spirit upon him. Showing you again that Jesus was human. We are still working on the humanity of Christ. And you will see why it's important. Now let's go to John. John's account takes it one step further. John chapter 1 verse 32. He takes it one step further. John chapter 1 verse 32. And John bore record saying... I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove. And it abode upon him. He said, I saw. He saw it. Eyewitness. Same word, to behold. To see in the Greek is the word teomai. Teomai. T-H-E-O-M-A-I. Teomai. It's used for sight. You actually saw it. It's not used for I perceive. I perceive he has a spirit upon. No, that's not what John said. He didn't say I know this. It's not a knowing. He said I saw the spirit come on him. So this was when Jesus was anointed. Eyewitness account. He saw it. How do we know Jesus was physically raised from the dead? The apostles saw it. How do we know that Jesus one day was anointed with the Holy Ghost? The apostles or the eyewitness writers saw it. All right, now that's very, very important. None of us has seen Jesus physically alive. None of us here. But the fact someone else bears witness to that, we believe their witness by faith. We believe their witness by faith. They didn't believe by faith. In their own instance, they saw it. So same thing. John saw Jesus. John saw the Holy Ghost come on Jesus. Literal descent. He said he saw it. He had an eyewitness. It was an actual, actual sight. He saw it remain on him. Remaining is the word menor in the Greek. Menor. It means to stay. That is the spirit staying on him. That's why Jesus now said in Luke chapter 4 verse 18. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me. 
The spirit of the Lord God. He didn't say because I came by the virgin birth. No. He said because he has anointed me. So the virgin birth was a different event from the anointing of Jesus. So anointing again means to add something. To paint. So the Holy Spirit was added upon Jesus in John's baptism. The Holy Spirit was added upon Jesus in John's baptism. Now let's go further. The Spirit was given to rest upon him. That is why John said, and remaining upon him. That was not when he became the Son of God. John said, I bear record that this is the Son of God. Notice that word, upon me. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. I see the Spirit descending upon him. It's used five times in the book of Acts. Once in Luke 24, 49, endued with power from on, on high. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon. Holy Ghost is come upon. Acts chapter 2 verse 3. Acts chapter 2 verse number 3. Acts 2 3. And there appeared unto them clothing tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. It sat upon upon acts chapter 8 verse 14 acts of the apostles chapter 8 verse 14 to 16 now when the apostles which were at jerusalem heard that samaria had received the word of god they sent unto them peter and john 15 who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the holy ghost 16 for as yet he was falling upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the house of Cornelius, Acts 10, 44. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 to 46. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. 45. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Next verse. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God then answered Peter. On the Gentiles. The spirit on the Gentiles. Acts 19 verse 6. Acts 19 verse 6. And when Paul has laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on, on, upon them. And they spake with tongues and prophesied. So, upon, 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 upon. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon, upon me, Jesus. Because he has anointed. Now, these scriptures we read, is it similar to the anointing of Jesus? Huh? Yes. Was there an upon upon Jesus? Was there an upon upon all of these instances? So it was similar. In John's case, don't forget, while in the book of Acts is descriptive, in John's case is literal. On the day of Pentecost, it was as like as like as fire, clothing tongues of fire. In, Pit, in John's case, he said, I saw the spirit descending and remaining on him. In John's case, literal, because John said, I saw. It's a literal description. And he calls that the anointing of Jesus. Listen carefully. Something we need to think about. How come the word anointed of the spirit is not used for the believer? How come that word anointed of the spirit 
is not used for the believer all through the New Testament. We will examine that in the identification. Because the term anointed of the spirit is not used for the believer. You have the word anointing used four times in the epistles. The first instance which I will help you understand is 2 Corinthians 1.21. 1.21. 2 Corinthians 1.21. Put it up quickly. A guy on the computer. I need somebody who is alive and awake. Now, he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. And in that verse of scripture, he was referring to Jesus. That Corinthians is a reference to Jesus. 1 John 2.20. 1 John 2.20. But you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. He calls it unction. 1 John 2.27. 1 John 2.27. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. And you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things. And is truth. And is no lie. And even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. James chapter 5 verse 14. James chapter 5 verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The, these are the only instances you find the word anoint or anointing used in the New Testament. You will not find anywhere it says in the epistles, you are anointed of the Holy Ghost. You won't find that anywhere in the epistles. It's not found in reference to the believer at all. The believer is not anointed of the Holy Ghost. It's not a reference. There's no reference at all in the epistles. Now keep that somewhere. Because we will get there. <laughs> we will get there. But to get to that point, we will have to lay a foundation in teaching. Then when we get there, you will find out why. So Jesus was anointed. The Pauline revelation doesn't teach you uh, anointed after the new birth. The Pauline theology does not teach believers that they are anointed after the new birth. After they are born again. John's reference, we will see why he uses the word unction. We will see why. Jesus is anointed of the Holy Spirit. Notice how Peter says it. For God was with him. Jesus anointed of the Holy Spirit. The incarnation. Jesus the man. He grew in wisdom and stature. That means he improved. That means when he was born in Mary's womb, he was imperfect because he grew. He added more knowledge and he was also anointed. Now, if that is that, it's not happening to him. If that anointing didn't happen to him, it will fault his humanity. So he had to be anointed to confirm that he's a man. Moreover, that was the only way the Holy Spirit was going to operate on him. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me. Now, and it's just because he is human. So because he's human, he just has to be human, you know. So, he is now on the cross. See what he says on the cross. Matthew 27, 46. Matthew 27 verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
He picks those words as spoken by David in Psalm 22 verse 1. It's a prophetic word. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's a prophecy. A prophetic word from David. It is picked up by Jesus. So we say that the words of Jesus were predicted. The words he spoke were predicted. Now what happened? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That word forsaken is the word abandoned. Why have you abandoned me? Question. Was Jesus abandoned? Was Jesus abandoned? Huh? Yes. Was he lying? When he said, why have you forsaken me? He was in line. So he was actually abandoned. So was Jesus abandoned on the cross? Yes. So when Peter says God was with him. Was God with him on the cross? No. Here Jesus. Matthew 27, 46. Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with, a loud, cried with a loud voice. Was he on the cross? Yes. Saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabathani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Hmm. Was he abandoned on the cross? Yes. Was God with him on the cross? No. 2 Corinthians 5 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he had made him to be seen for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That means that when there was a separation, Kabayada, God was separated from Jesus. God separated himself from Jesus on the cross. He was anointed by the spirit. But on the cross, God abandoned him and was separated from Jesus. Are we still in the building? Now. So that means that there was a separation for Jesus on the cross. Yes. That separation, huh, I am a, that separation on the cross is spiritual death. Jesus died spiritually and physically. Jesus died spiritually. So when the father separated from Jesus, that separation is spiritual death. That separation. And that is the same thing that happened with Adam in Eden. The day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And Adam ate of it, he surely died. But when he died, he was still walking. So it was not physical extinction, it was spiritual separation. That same separation that happened to Adam happened to Jesus on the cross. Why? Because he came on my behalf. Are we still in the building? Separation. All right now. So the father was separated from Jesus. Please stay with me now. That means on the cross, there was a separation. All right now. He is not a man that became God. He is God that became a man. Go back to Luke 24. But before we read. So in Jesus' death, he was abandoned of God. In his anointing, God was with him. Huh. Is that true? In his death, God abandoned him. In the anointing, God was with him. Now look at Luke chapter 24, verse 26. Please stay with me. Luke 24, 26. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory, the word suffer, 
refers to his death. That word enter and to enter is another literal word used by Paul in Romans 5.12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. Is the word esekomai in the Greek. E-I-S-E C-H-O-M-A-I Esekomai. It means sin was not in the world until that man. So when you use the word esekomai, it means whatever you are referring to was not in until now. So when he says, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory, that means he was not in that glory until he was raised from the dead. He has never been in that glory before. He was not in that glory until he was raised from the dead. Luke used it in Luke chapter 6 verse 6. Esekomai. Luke used it in Luke chapter 6 verse 6. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath he, that he entered into the synagogue and taught. He entered. Esekomai. He entered entered into the synagogue he came into the synagogue that is here the glory must have been somewhere and jesus went or goes into it all right now don't forget jesus died the sufferings of christ jesus died the sufferings of christ and the glory that will follow. So he died to enter into the glory. He died to enter into the glory. A lot of people believe that, you know, Jesus was on his, you know, throne. Having a great time. When he said, let me go to the world for 33 and a half years. Then he goes there. Then after he finished there, he went back to the throne where he was before he came. No, that's not what happened. The word esekomai means he was not there until now. He wasn't in that glory until now. What's the word glory? The word glory is from the Hebrew word kabod. Kabod, K-A-B-O-D. And it's the Greek word doxa. Doxa, D-O-X-A. Kabod, doxa. Okay, now, it's the word doxa in the Greek, taken from the word kabod in the Hebrew. It is used for something that is weighty and heavy. It's used for worth, something used for value, used for kings with wealth and honor. So when he says, ought not Christ to have suffered these things, referring to his death, and to enter into his glory, he must have been referring to something weighty, something of value, something of worth that he entered into. So, Jesus rose from the dead and entered into his glory. Hallelujah. Now, there was something of splendor, of worth, that he rose up to. Or he rose up for. And he entered into. And of course. You know we are referring to his resurrection. Okay. Now. We all agree that this glory happened upon his resurrection. It couldn't have been in his death. It had to be upon his resurrection. You can call it the glory of his work. The glory of his work. This is the glory of what he has done. Because glory must be relative. Glory of what? Glory of his work. Or that is, this is the crown of his redemptive work. Or the crown of his sacrificial work. That is, 
everything Jesus did, this is the crown of it. This is the icing on the cake. Hayabada. Are you still in the building? That is, this is the climax of all of his work. And this is where he was going. From the incarnation to the crucifixion, to the death, to the burial, to the resurrection, to the ascension, this glory was his climax. This was the consummation or the crowning of all that he was heading to. This was his destination point. This was his point of arrival. Are you still in the building? All right, so to enter into his glory means this is the ultimate. To enter into his glory. Now, the death of Jesus was the beginning. He died. He suffered. Then he entered into his glory. Something weighty. Something of value. That is, this is the crown of his work. This is the height of what he did. This is the worth, the value of all that he intended to accomplish. Are we still in the building? The glory that will follow. Let's view, let's view a few facts very quickly, very quickly. There are some things you read in the four gospels that Jesus was speaking of that glory. Not of the present ministry. Not of the present glory, but in the four gospels. Look at Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Did he save his people from their sins in the four gospels? No. For he shall save his people from their sins. But was anybody saved by Jesus in the four gospels? No. When did he save his people from their sins? When he rose from the dead. In other words, this statement had nothing to do with, with his at work. The statement had nothing to do with his at work. I show you more. John chapter 10 verse 10. John chapter 10 verse 10. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The original is that you may have life and you are abundant. There is nothing like life abundantly. You have life and because of that life, you are abundant. Now, did anybody have life in Jesus' at work? No. Alright, now, even though that is why he came, but he couldn't give anybody life. He couldn't save anybody. So the glory of his work is that he will save his people. The glory of his work is that he will give life. But in his earthly work, he was not qualified to give life. That means there was a greatness after he rose from the dead. In his earthly work, he couldn't give life. Look at John chapter 3 verse 3. Pay attention. John chapter 3 verse number 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, <laughs> Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Could you have been born again in Jesus' earthly work? No. John 3 16. John 3 16. Put it up for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever believes in him. Give me John 3, 14. <clears throat> John chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Next verse. That whosoever 
believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Mm. The word lifted up does not mean lift Jesus higher, lift him up higher. No, lifted up means to kill him. To kill him. So if you use that verse to sing, what you're saying is kill Jesus higher. Kill Jesus. To lift in Bible language means to kill. So what Jesus means by have everlasting life will be upon his death and resurrection. Are we still in the building? Even though that statement was made as though you can receive it now, but no. Because that is the glory of his work. He couldn't give anybody life because that glory was reserved for his resurrection. Glory to God. Look at Matthew 3, 11. Then I'll ask you a few questions. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes am not worthy to be a. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. With the Holy Ghost and with fire. Keep that somewhere. Let me ask you another question. When Jesus rose from the dead, did he rise from the dead alone? No. Okay, very good. <clears throat> Matthew 27, 51. Matthew 27, 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. 52. And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose. The saints which slept arose. But then we have Peter's explanation. Acts chapter 2 verse 29. Get him blessed. Acts chapter 2 verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. That he is both dead and buried. And his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Next verse. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him. That of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he will raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Next verse. He is seeing this. Before speak of the resurrection of Christ. That his soul was not left in hell. Neither did his flesh see corruption. Next verse. This Jesus. Had God raised up. Whereof we are all witnesses. David dead and buried. Does it mean that it is David's sepulchre. Does it mean that David's sepulchre is still there and David is still in it? Huh? No. What he seems to be doing is a distinction between Jesus and David. He is not saying in actuality that David is dead and buried. Look at the prophecy of the resurrection of Christ. Isaiah 26, 19. The prophecy of his resurrection. Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing ye that dwell in dust. For thy dew is at the dew of herbs. And the earth shall cast out the dead. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body. Shall they arise. That's the prophecy. So he said, their dead bodies will be made alive with mine. That's the prophecy. That their dead body, that's the prophecy concerning Jesus' resurrection. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. 
First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. First fruits of them that sleep. First fruit is often in the plural. Often. Romans 11.16 Romans 11.16 is the only kind or the exception. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. This was not definitive. Okay? Now, it is always used in the plural. Look at Romans 16 verse 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epenetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. The first fruit. The Jews know that the first fruit is a part of the harvest. Actually, first fruit means more than one. It means a bunch. A bunch. Let's see where this same thing was now clearly repeated and clarified. First Corinthians 16, 15. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanas, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Very good addiction. To the ministry of the saints. That plural refers to the church. First fruit is always used as plural people together. Harvest together. So first fruit in plural. Revelation 17 verse 4. Revelation 17 verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Having a golden cup. Uh, that's not the right scripture. Anyway, so actually, first fruit is in order of harvest. First, then the whole harvest. Which makes the first fruit a prototype. A prototype. First Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. Just pay attention. First Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. Mm -mm. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. Next verse. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Next verse. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Next verse. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ are his coming. So, the resurrection of Jesus Christ covered more than him. First fruits. He wasn't alone. That's why we had that Matthew 27 where he says the graves were open and the bodies of those that were dead rose with him. That was the first fruit of the resurrection. That is this becomes the example. This becomes the prototype. So, the folds in Hades, one, the folds, the Old Testament folks, we are saved, spirit, soul, and body. They were saved. Because this becomes the example, Christ, the first fruit. And the prophecy says, their dead body will be raised together with mine. Okay? Will be made alive with mine. So in the resurrection of Jesus, all the saints that slept rose with him in that resurrection. And they have become the first fruits. Just like Jesus appeared to Mary. Look at Matthew 27 verse 52. Jesus appeared not to everybody. He appeared to a selected audience. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Next verse, next verse. And came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. 
They didn't appear to everybody. They appeared unto many. Just like Jesus did not appear to everybody. He appeared to a selected few. For how long? Bible says for 40 days. He was around. And he appeared unto a selected number. So the first fruit refers to the initial harvest of the whole harvest. So the resurrection will follow that order. Physical resurrection, just like Jesus, they appeared unto many. They were just physically alive like Jesus. In Acts chapter 1 verse 1. <laughs> you know, put it up. Acts 1, 1 to 3. Hallelujah. Acts 1, 1. The, the former treatise have I made O Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Next verse. Until the day in which he was taken up. After that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Three. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. Being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So the guys in Matthew 27, did they show themselves alive? Yes. Were they alive? Yes. He says their bodies rose because Jesus' physical body rose. So if you go to Jerusalem today, will you find David's body in the grave? What about Abraham? Jacob, Isaac. Why? Because on the resurrection of Jesus, all of them rose with their bodies. So their bodies are no more in the grave. Are we in the building? David's body and all the saints rose together with Christ. You won't find Abraham's body. Jesus' tomb is empty. They rose physically 2,000 years ago. They rose just like Jesus. So when he says he led captivity captive. Hallelujah. He let it was an event. Jesus went to Hades and they left Hades together. When they rose, they rose together. You and I don't go to Hades anymore. Hades has been shut down. Because those in Hades rose with the champion. <laughs> Bible says he led captivity captive. So the cloud of witnesses, the cloud of witnesses were together with Jesus. The spirits of just men perfected at last. So they are born again. Spirit, soul, and body. Their bodies change. And they are in heaven with their physical bodies just like Jesus. First fruits. First fruits. Whatever is in the first fruits will be in the other. So when we see what happened to them, we know what is about to happen to us. Oh, somebody shout, I hear you. Mortality shall put on immortality. Corruption shall put on incorruption. We shall be changed. Just like they were changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Yeah. And we will rise and be together with Jesus forever. I thought somebody would shout hallelujah. Now, so we can solve what happened to the 12. <laughs> we are back to the 120 and the 12. We can solve it. So now, were the 12 saved before Acts chapter 2? Yes. Did they have the Holy Ghost before Acts chapter 2? Yes. Because to be born again means to be indwelt by the Spirit. So they had the Holy Ghost. So what did they not have? Let's examine the feast a little. There are two feasts. Jesus came to fulfill. One is the Passover. Passover. In the Passover, you have the judgment of sin. Where you have redemption. Where you have redemption. Then we have the first fruits. Which is the feast of weeks. When Israel was born. And God gave them a law where they became a royal priesthood, a holy nation unto God in the law. The day Israel was born, Jesus, by his death, fulfilled Passover. And he rose from the dead. So when Jesus rose from the dead, was forgiveness of sins immediately. 
Yes. So what did he do after 40 days? He goes to heaven. He comes back to talk for 40 days and says, wait for 10 days by the Jewish calendar which will be Pentecost. Which will be Pentecost because there were two events. Passover and the first fruits. The feast of weeks. Are we in the building? So now, he goes the second time to do what? Mark 16, 19. Pay attention as a roundup. Mark 16, 19. So then, after the Lord has spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And we know what right hand is. It's not right hand. Right hand is regency. He sat on the right hand of God. Acts 2, 32. Acts chapter 2 verse 32. This Jesus had God raised up. Whereof we are all witnesses. 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he had shed for this. He had shed for this, which you now see and hear. So he sat. Huh? And when he sat, what did he do? He shed forth. So the first time he went to heaven, he did not sit. He appeared in the presence of God for us. Then he came down and entered the room without window and door where he ate. Okay? Now, so his resurrection brought us forgiveness of sins. Romans 4.25 Who was raised again for our justification. And 1 Corinthians 15.14 If Christ be not risen, you are yet in your sins. So from the moment he rose from the dead, forgiveness of sins was available. Now, next question. Did the twelve receive forgiveness of sins when Jesus rose? Yes. Were they born again? Uh, answer me emphatically. Were they born again? Were they born of the spirit? Yes. Was the spirit available at the resurrection? Yes. So what happened in Acts chapter 2? Huh? You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses. That instruction is for who? Tarry in Jerusalem. Was that instruction for us or for the twelve? So today, we do not tarry. Because any church that teaches that you have to tarry for the Holy Ghost, is misleading you. You don't tarry. Because if you are going to tarry, you have to go to Jerusalem. The instruction said, tarry ye where? He didn't say, tarry ye in Akwaibom. He didn't say, tarry ye in Uyo. He said, it has to be in Jerusalem, specific. It wasn't ambiguous. So that instruction is not for us. That instruction is for the twelve. Why in Jerusalem, the feast of Pentecost, where everybody will return and that calendar will be fulfilled. And it was going to be for 10 days. Okay? Tarry until. Okay? And then he asked, you shall receive. After that he went. 10 days after 40 was Pentecost. Because Pentecost is 50. 40 days Jesus taught. 10 days after 40. 50. Pentecost is 50. And that was the calendar for the outpouring of the spirit. Are we still in the building here? So now, what we can add to Acts 1.8 is to tarry. Why were they to tarry in Jerusalem? Because that is where they celebrate Pentecost. 
So Acts 1 8 is not applicable to you. You do not tarry in Jerusalem. That's where the answer is. So why didn't they receive, why didn't they speak in tongues after the 40 days of teaching? Because the timing of the outpouring of the spirit was specific at Pentecost. So that's why after 40 days, they waited for 10 days and the prophecy was fulfilled. Just like Jesus was born at the appointed time. Moses kept shouting, show me your glory. I want to see your glory. God said, not now. Because the glory is the visible appearance of Jesus. That's why I said, we beheld his glory. When we saw him, we saw the glory. Moses wanted to see Jesus incarnation. And God said, not now. There's an appointed time. So when the fullness of the time was come. So every event was according to the scriptures. Today, we are no more waiting for any timing. All of the prophecies have been fulfilled in Christ. So you come into Christ, you receive everything. The moment you get born again, you speak in tongues, you prophesy. You heal the sick, you cast out demons. You raise the dead. The moment you receive Jesus, you are ready to start ministry. You receive it and you minister him to others. Are we teaching good here? So is it clear now what happened to the 120 when they were born again, when they spoke in tongues, when they received the spirit, all of that we have been able to clarify them clearly. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Somebody shout hallelujah. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. What are the sufferings of Christ? Death, barrier. What is the glory that will follow? Resurrection, exhortation, ascension, and that glory, he has never been in it before. So we are going to begin to look into that glory as we continue teaching tomorrow. If you are blessed, get on your feet and shout, Bless! Amen! Amen. Woo, Father, we rejoice. We rejoice that we have access into the deep things of God by the Holy Ghost. Thank you for revelation knowledge growing in this place like a flood. The eyes of your people's understanding flooded with light. You are strengthened with might by the spirit in the inner man. Christ dwells in your hearts by faith. I decree that the revelation of Jesus grows big on your inside until nothing else matters. We take authority over every sickness, disease, the oppression of the enemy. Lose your holes in the name of Jesus. Sick bodies be healed. O Gabano, Corona Suka, La Baraneka, Angre de Joko, La de Bambra, Rato Mekila Namaha. Bodies be healed in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answers to prayer. Oh, Father, we rejoice. We rejoice. We rejoice that men and women of God are being equipped all over the Blue Marble planet. Men and women of God are rising empowered to preach the gospel all over the nations. Disciples are raised and Jesus is glorified. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Amen. Glory! Amen. Now listen, I want to take up your offerings because in another two minutes I'll be joining Mr. Michael Bush. We'll answer your call, respond to your questions and emails and ensure that we continue to make sure that the things you have raised as concerns are clearly taken care of. We give in faith, we give into the word, we give in honor of Christ. Always a joy to serve you the grace of God. I want to thank all our partners all over the world who continue to partner with us to enable us to do the things we do all over the world. Thank you for your givings. Thank you for your sacrifices. Through you, many lives have been beautified with the grace of God. And you never lack any good thing. In Jesus' name. Lift up your offerings, Father. We give in faith. We give with joy. Thank you for the privilege to give tonight. And we thank you for your word that is building us up, making us fit to preach this gospel and rightly divide the word of truth. As we give in faith, our offerings is in honor of Christ's finished work. And we thank you that both we and our givings are accepted before you. Thank you for the blessing tonight. We give you praise for answered prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Whoa, I'm excited. I tell you, you don't want to go away. You want to stay and hang around with us and just enjoy the next few minutes with us as we, you know, embark on Ask the Counselor. But listen very carefully. The new books are out and you can place your order by calling our office or send a mail to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. And do me the favor, go on my Facebook page, just check, check. You will see the pictures 
of the book and the adverts of the book. Help me share them. Let more people gain access to them and so that people can get the materials and use them to equip themselves. We love you guys. See you in the next one or two minutes. And until then, enjoy the grace of Christ. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate our viewers around the world for being a part of this service tonight. Glory! Amen! Woo! I tell you, I'm excited. By this message, for these, all the messages, and books by Dr. Abel Damino, please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email Power City Office at gmail.com. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your spirit and in your body, which are God. So your spirit and your body is sealed until the day when mortality puts on immortality. Sin cannot break the seal individual mistakes cannot break the seal persecution cannot break the seal nakedness cannot break the seal hunger cannot break the seal famine cannot break the seal i am fully persuaded that nothing in this life nor in the life to come shall be able to separate us from the love of god which is in christ where are you in christ what keeps you there the love of god Join Drs. Abel and Rachel Daminer in New Christian Camp Meeting 2021 and Ask the Counselor with Michael Bush. Theme in Christ Realities. Ministry, Dr. Abel Daminer. Date 31st January to 14th February 2021. Time, Mondays to Saturdays, 6 p.m. daily on Inspiration FM 105.9 Rio, Comfort FM 95.1 Rio, Excel FM 106.9 Rio, Radio Aquaibo 90.5 Rio, Unio FM 100.7 Rio, and Heritage FM 104.9. And also live on Sundays, 7.30 a.m. first service and 10.30 a.m. second service. Venue, Power City International, number 98 Wangibo Road, Rio, Aquaibom State, Nigeria. You can also watch this program live on Kingdom Live Network TV on your strong decoder or my TV decoder. You can also follow Abel Damino's Facebook page, Public Figure, as well as YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram handles to watch real time. Host, Drs. Abel and Rachel Daminer. <laughs>